How's it, guys? Today we will be discussing a management of a bradycardia. We're going to just beginning at the top of the algorithm, really. So the question is, you need to identify a bradycardia that is below 50 and is causing a problem. So is the patient stable or unstable? You would have seen in my previous video about tachycardias up here, is that stable is a bad word. We're not talking about horses and that we should be looking at, are they shocked or not shocked? Are they perfused or not perfusing? That's going to tell us really what's happening. Right. If you have a bradycardia that is not in shock and is perfusing very well, there's actually nothing you need to do but monitor and transport. You must be aware that they might have a third degree block running at a rate of like 20, 25, and they're actually fine because their blood pressure will be massive and that will compensate for the perfusion. But then you have patients who are not perfusing or who are not stable, and these are the patients who we're going to be dealing with. So the first line thing would be atrophy. So what's actually important to clarify is that there is some talk about dealing with um, how unstable a patient is, is that we need to have more than just stable or unstable. They actually say that we need to have like unstable patient and then we need to have a like peri-arrest crashing patient because there's two different people. Someone might be having a slow heart rate or bradycardia and they're not crashing right now. So we have a bit of time. These are the kind of people who you might try atropine with. But then you have the peri-arrest crashing patient. These are the patients who we're not going to try atropine with. The thing about atropine is that it actually doesn't work in all the patients. Because atropine, all it does is it poisons the vagus nerve and it decreases our parasympathetic nervous system. That's the one that helps us digest food and rest. It's so that our sympathetic can surge and therefore have an increase in heart rate. But that only works with people who have increased vagal tone, which is a very small bubble of people. What they're actually saying now that in the uh, peri-arrest patient who's actually doing really well, rather than giving atropine as a trial, give a push dose presser. And how we're going to do that is you're going to take one amp of adrenaline, you're going to draw it up into 10 mils. Then you're going to take one mil of that 10 mils and you're going to draw it up again to 10 mils, five to 10 micrograms per mil. And then you can give one to two mils of that. So that would be a typical push dose pressure, press, press, presser. And the other way you can do, which is a bit dirty, is that you can take the um, cardiac um, adrenaline, which is already diluted. You can take that and you can give half a mil of that. So you might find that you miss dose because it's quite hard to give half a mil of a 10 mil syringe or a 20 mil syringe actually. Um, but half a mil of a cardiac adrenaline is the right dose for a push dose presser. But it is pretty hard to do. But if you're in a tricky situation, that probably is the quickest way to do it. So if you have a crashing peri arrest um, patient who's in a bradycardia, you are going to do that. The other really important thing about atropine is that there are three patients who we do not give atropine to. These are the triple H's of atropine. If you can try guess them. Head injury. Do not give a patient who's in a bradycardia because of a head injury atropine. Going to kill them. Hypoxia. Do not give a patient who is hypoxic atropine who's in a bradycardia because you're going to kill them. And hypothermia. Do not give these patients atropine. So now that we have looked at um, the unstable or not perfused patient or the shocked patient and the critically uh, peri-arrest patient, we're going to not give the atropine because that may or may not work. It can even um, cause bradycardic if you give the wrong dose and it only works on some patients. So we're going to give a push dose presser. Got it right there. And that will work very well because it will affect everyone and it will work for everything. So then you come down to the bottom of the algorithm and it says transcutaneous pacing or adrenaline or inotrope or dopamine or whatever else you want to try, but it will say transcutaneous pacing or inotrope. So how do you make the decision about these things? Well, if you have a bradycardia due to a cardiac origin, the patient's now having a third degree or a second degree or something is wrong with the heart, pacing would be the best thing because for multiple reasons. One is it's the heart that's the problem. So we're wanting the heart to actually contract better. And if it can't contract because of um, a third degree block, adrenaline may not be the most effective thing. So what we wanted to do is get the heart to contract. We want the heart to contract faster and harder. If we have a patient who's in a bradycardia due to a third degree, we're going to want to pace. Adrenaline also takes a bit of time to set up where pacing is much quicker and 
pacing can be turned on, turned off, and it's very controlled. The place where you're going to use adrenaline infusion for a bradycardia is more like a drug-induced bradycardia. So a uh, overdose on beta blockers would be a really good place to give adrenaline because that is going to cause all of the other parts of the bodies to, you know, we're going to have um, vasoconstriction, we're going to have your, your positive chronotrope, dromotrope, inotrope. I have made a video on um, inotropes up here, check it out, I really enjoyed making that, very interesting. So when you're going to do pacing or inotrope. Pacing, exactly how you do pacing, well on every monitor that I've seen, you have to actually turn on the pacing module, which you can look at something like this. So you hit the pacing module button and then that brings up the pacing module options. You want to drop your milliamps to as low as it can and you can set your rate to 70 or 80 or whatever you want to do. And then you can set whether you want to have demand or fixed. Fixed is obviously just going to give a pace no matter what. Um, demand means that if the patient's heart rate actually goes above your rate, it will stop. Depending on where you are, what you're doing, if you're flying, if you're on an ambulance or if you're in a hospital, you can choose if you want it to be demand or fixed. Demand is a bit hard when you're moving, like ambulance or helicopter, because it's vibration and that doesn't work so well, because an ECG in a moving helicopter is a bit of a challenge. The other part is that then you're going to turn on the pacing. So the module's on, and then you turn, you start the pacing. Once the pacing has started, you're going to increase your milliamps until you have electrical capture. On the ECG, you will see a large spike, and that'll be the ventricle contracting. Once you have electrical capture, you will check for mechanical capture. So you check for a pulse. Don't use the carotid because that's very close to the pads. That causes a contraction of the muscle and it's going to give you a false understanding of a pulse. I would definitely recommend you check for a radial or ephemeral. Ephemeral will give you a much lower blood pressure, obviously. So if you can feel a radial pulse, we know that we have a great blood pressure. Once you have your mechanical capture and your um, electrical capture, then you have your physiological capture where you're going to check your blood pressures and make sure the patient's actually perfusing. And if you want to, you can then start dealing with your pain management because this is quite painful, as you can imagine. So uh, really, that is the how to deal with a bradycardia. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.